Hello everyone! Uh, this is my first video on this new series, uh, History in All Shades, that I announced just a bit ago, and I'm releasing this first video at the same time on my Patreon and on YouTube, um, because I just want to get this first video out there for people to see and enjoy. I'm not going to do this with every video, most of them are going to be released on my Patreon first, and then after a little while, they'll be released on YouTube as well. Um, <laughs> Oh, I'm so looking forward to this, and I'm also just a little bit nervous, so bear with me. Uh, let's see. So, for this first video, I want to do something a little bit, um, I say different, even though it's my first video, but I'm not really going to do um, a person who is still alive very often, because my focus is going to be wider history. But for this first video, I wanted to find... A figure who was still alive, still in power. Um, I hope to inspire people, but that's not the way that turned out as I got more and more into the research, <laughs> sadly. Uh, but it's still a very interesting case of, um, of a woman in power uh, who's not white. Um, and, uh, you know, say, history will judge and, um, and all that. Uh, so... I actually couldn't find very much about this woman specifically, but I could find a lot about people related to her, but it is a fact that she holds power. Uh, but before I get into all that, um, I want to discuss some issues that come up because the subject is still alive. Um, so, uh, let's see. You know, with this close, this close to the time frame, or actually still within the time frame of the subject's life, um, or even you know, ten years, twenty years, as much as fifty to even a hundred years after their death, there's some issues that crop up that um, are make an issue to discuss historically in a non-biased way. Um, I'm going to talk about these real quick. My notes. Uh, so one issue is um, documents relating to their lives and government is still secret within their family or, you know, since they're in power, it's still a part of national security, um, not released available to the wider public for us to look over to provide a more balanced um, account of their lives um, because uh, they're still alive. Um, they were alive recent, in the recent past, something like that. Another issue is um, their immediate family and friends, or in some cases enemies, are still alive as well. So um, it, uh, documents from family and friends or enemies are not available as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, we could... Uh, gather testimonials from their family, friends, or enemies, uh, but we can't really conduct an unbiased analysis of their life uh, at this point in time. So, uh, <laughs> um, it's, oh, sh you can't separate the, the, a person, especially in government, you can't separate someone from their government and, you know, yeah, government security, um, government secrets, um, secret documents. Um, I think uh, an example was, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, scattered at the moment, uh, King George um, in England, the king who lost uh, the American colonies in the Civil War, uh, I think documents relating to his life, personal documents, like letters he wrote and such, were only just released to the public within the last 10 or 15 years. So you think even in England, this is the case. You know, you can't really um, evaluate a person after a decade after they, after they died or longer um, in the case of Wow, it's been 200 years since George lost the colonies of America, so, uh, yeah, I'm rambling, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's a good uh, pinpoint for us to look at, is regarding, regarding um, 
the release of documents relating to people's lives. Um, and that's the only reason why I bring that up. Um, as to the subject, I haven't even said her name yet. So um, I wanted to, I found uh, her name and I got really curious about her. So I started doing some research and that was Friday and now it's Sunday night. <laughs> so uh this is um I'm not gonna go into another ramble again real quick. Um Nefombi of Swaziland or Swatini. Okay, and okay, now I'm gonna go into that ramble again. <laughs> Uh, Pronunciation-wise, I actually uh, Google, not Google, looked up a video on YouTube that I hope pronounces all these names correctly, and I used that to write a little pronunciation guide for myself. So I hope I'm pronouncing these names correctly. Um, they'll be written, typed down below in the in the not comments in the description of the video, both on my Patreon and on YouTube, so you can look at them as well. Um, because I'm not really familiar with pronouncing uh, S -S Swahili names, <laughs> but I'm trying my best, I swear. <laughs> okay, so she is, again, Queen Nefombi of Swaziland, or Swatini. Um, and let's begin into that, what that means exactly. Um, so we're going to start with what I could find about Swaziland's history. The royal dynasty was founded sometime during the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, I haven't been able to find an exact date, uh, but somewhere in there it was founded. Um, during the 1800s, you had a lot of Europeans moving into the area, and in 1817 the kingdom was annexed by the British. Uh, let's see. Um, and, uh, they, the British ruled Swaziland um, for about 60 years, uh, but the monarchy was still active during that time. Uh, and <laughs> um, my first source for all this was at National Geographic magazine online, and they were a little bit more um, forgiving of Britain about this than I would have been. So, and, and other sources were. So, this is a direct quote from National Geographic: Britain granted the kingdom its independence in 1969. Granted the kingdom its independence. <laughs> um, and another source uh, was a little bit more. Um, it sounded like more of a victory for Swaziland. Independence was finally achieved on September 6th, 1968. Uh, 66 years after the establishment of the British Protectorate. That's a direct quote. And all my sources are listed below as well. <sighs> Crossing all my T's and dotting all my I's. Okay, so, and um, the country if it does have, uh, was called Swaziland at this time. Um, in 2018, the king changed the name to Swatini. So, like, I'm going to go back. I'm going to probably use both names because, like, the new name is only two years old. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, so what happened once the British left was that um, the British, when they left, they established or somehow um, arranged to establish uh, a parliamentary democracy. Uh, but this had been a kingdom they had taken over. Uh, and the new king, or the current king at the time that they left was, uh, names, uh, Sobuza II. Um, uh, he just, he felt, you know, this was a foreign imposed constitution um, that there was nothing in the customs and traditions of Swaziland that allowed for such a thing. And he felt that this was a further threat on his power brought in by their, they weren't really conquerors, but overseers, the British, and then left behind when they left. Uh, so in 
1973, he overturned the Constitution, um, brought the monarchy back into an absolute monarchy, and outlawed political parties. Uh, and he granted himself supreme authority over all the arms of the government. Um, I mean, you can kind of see his side, just objectively, you can see his side on this. You know, he was the king during the years that the British ruled Swaziland, even though he was the monarch. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that as similar to the situation in North Korea currently. So you can see both sides of this. Um, and ultimately, this is what happened. He overturned the Constitution, and now he is a absolute monarch of Swaziland. For better or for worse, that's what happened. Um, and he was very popular in his time. Um, he, you know, they talk about him like he's a man of the people. Um, it's just, uh, and a lot of the Swazi population applauded this um, change, or they said they applauded this change at the time, because, uh, you know, they went back to their roots of being an absolute monarchy, yet, as they were before the British came in, I suppose. Um, so, it makes sense. Um, you want to uh, loosen the shackles a little bit more that they still felt were there even after the British left. Um, but, uh, as time went on, this, there became difficulties with being an absolute monarch, and we'll, I'll get into that more later. Um, so that happened. Uh, so let's talk real quick about swap the traditional Swaziland. Um, it is Africa's last absolute monarchy. Uh, it's one of Africa's smallest countries. Uh, the king is polygamous. He has many wives. 60% um, of the land is owned by the king, and 70% of its citizens live on land that is held in trust by the king. I got these facts from two different sources, so they might both be correct. Um, might be because uh, one said sixty percent, one said seventy percent, so it might be somewhere in, somewhere in the middle, I suppose. Um, so the king can impose his authority, and he can evict the tenants who live on either the sixty percent of his land or the seventy percent of his land without recourse. So sixty sixty to seventy percent of the land. Um, in Swaziland, you can get evicted on without recourse. <laughs> you can become homeless if the king so chooses. Um, let's see. And strange, um, I say strange, but this is the Swazi custom. Um, kings in Swaziland do not select their successors. Uh, once the king dies, um, a queen mother is selected from among the king's wives, and she becomes regent um, on the king's death. And then um, there's a new king, who my sources say is often a younger child, son of the king, a young child, who is uh, chosen to be the next king and groomed uh, by the advisors of the kingdom. Well, the Queen Mother rules. So, <laughs> that's where we start getting into talking about Queen Nitfombi. Uh, so, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, this was the case when um, Sobuza came to the throne. He was. Uh, a young child, and it was his mother who ruled as his regent, and um, I believe she probably continued to rule even once he became an adult, because that is the case um, current with the current king and the queen mother uh, that I'm talking about, um, ne Nefombi, the queen mother. 
Um, so, King Subuza II, uh, he was widely admired in his time. Um, he da he had uh, 70 wives. Um, people thought of him as like a man of the people. And he ruled until his death in 1982. And that's when we have a period of transition. Um, which where it gets a little bit strange. It might step outside the customs um, with regards to what happened. Because it's reading between the lines, it almost it feels a bit like a coup <laughs> about what happened after he died. So he can't choose his, his successor. Um, I don't think he can even choose his uh, which senior wife acts as regent for his successor. But we'll get to that. Um, so when he died in 1982, his most senior wife, who was a queen called Ziliwe, Queen Ziliwe, took over the regency, uh, or was selected to take over the regency, but something went wrong um, with with her. Um, Regency. It does, I couldn't find a record of which prince she was ruling as a regent for. It would have been her son, I assume, but I can't find his name anywhere. Um, and after a time, uh, the royal council had her dismissed. Um, and gosh, and then they found um, Nitfumbe. And most of the sources I found say that Nipfumbe had married or was married to the king, um, so Sobuza II. Uh, but at least one source says they were not married at the time of his death. Um, they say, uh, and that source, which I found very interesting, uh, again, National Geographic, but still very interesting, uh, said that. Um, after they uh, dismissed the senior wife as queen mother, um, they found uh, Netfumbi uh, in, where do they find her? <laughs> oh, she was living outside the palace. Um, uh, my notes are a little bit jumbled at this point. Um, okay, she was living in a working class neighborhood. Um, but allegedly they want the council wanted a successor they could control. So they found her in a working class neighborhood and they summoned her son, um, the prince who was later crowned. Sawati the third, um, at the time they, when they found his mother, he was in a boarding school in England and he became, he was 15 years old and he became a uh, king in waiting while his mother, Netfumbi, became his regent. Um, and so, according to what I read in National Geographic, um, Netfumbi was never married to the previous king. Uh, uh, she was, I believe she was a ma she'd been a maid. Um, let me see, let me find this. Ugh, notes, 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 so many notes. Okay, so... Okay, so she was a teenage maid in the house. According to this, the National Geographic, she was a teenage maid in the house of one of his wives, his favorite wives. And she was banished when she became pregnant in 1967. Uh, and then 16 years later, when they wanted to depose or dismiss the queen regent, the first queen regent, they found her and they, um, they staged a marriage between Netfumbi, the queen, the woman who would become the queen mother, and the, the king, uh, so, uh, pronunciation guide, the king, Subuza the third, the second. And remember, uh, Subuza II is already dead at this point, so <laughs> there was, they, 
they he was he was there um at the marriage ceremony according to National Geographic, but he already passed away. <laughs> uh yeah. So they staged this marriage ceremony between them, and now every other source I found, aside from the National Graphic, says that they were married for sure, but it might have been after he died. <laughs> so they found, they brought her son back from boarding school in England, and he became the king, the underage king, and she became regent. Now, um, it's one of the problems of, you know, being so close to the actual events. Um, it's hard to say what exactly that means or how much power she has and what she can decide to do, either when she was regent or even today now that he's still king, because they, they, uh, she rules together with her son still. Um, and that's, that's traditional in Swahili land. Uh, so... It's hard to say what the do. I couldn't find anything about what the duties of each are, what the responsibilities of each are, um, what one can do that the other can't do, just how much power she actually has. But every source acknowledges that they rule jointly together, so she must have some degree of power, uh, real political power, because it's an absolute monarchy. <laughs> um, but it seems like since the council could dismiss a queen regent, that the council must have significant power as well. <laughs> um, so, during um, her son's coronation, they staged that marriage between Natfumbi and um, her son's father, the previous king, even though he was dead. Um, and... Yeah. So her son, King Swati the Third, was crowned on what day was he crowned? Um, he was crowned at the age of eighteen on April twenty fifth, nineteen eighty six. And at the time, he was 18 at the time, so he was born on April 19th, 1968. Um, so, yeah. And he was 15 years old when he was summoned from England. Um, and he rules the country jointly with his mother. And again, it's hard to find anything particular about her personality, because it's all, all the information I had related specifically to him, but you can kind of build just a little bit of her story, I suppose, because the marriage thing sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, so, let's see, one source I read claimed that the king was a Christian, but um, I did read another source that said there were significant uh, supernatural powers customarily traditionally uh, related to um, the king, um, like supernatural beliefs, um, so that w probably aren't necessarily Christian, so I'm not quite sure how to, um, maybe, maybe they both go together well, um, but maybe they don't, and maybe the Christian thing was incorrect, I'm not entirely sure, but the king has a belief in supernatural powers related to his kingship, and so his mother probably does as well. Um, now let's talk about <laughs> briefly about this king, her son, uh, Swati the Third. Um, they call him a playboy prince. Uh, wow, he has fifteen wives, as far as I can gather. Um, uh, several children. Um, one source said 13 princes and 22 princesses, but there might be others. Um, it's hard to get an exact list of names of his wives or his children. Um, I did find one that might be good. It's just a little confusing because there's just so many. Um, and some of them, some of the names are spelled differently across different sources. Um, he has 13 royal palaces. Um, lots of Mercedes and BMWs, a private jet, um, so trouble with 
the way he came to the throne is he wasn't really prepared for the position from birth. Um, he was he was not expected to come to the throne. Um, probably one of his brothers, half brothers, was. I don't know who that half brother would have been, but some son of a uh, queen. Ziliwe, uh, but he was definitely not. And you can kind of see that in what's happened since. Um, he wasn't trained in diplomacy, Swazi traditions. Um, just, he had four years prepared to be king when he was already, you know, king in waiting or junior king or however you want to refer to it, while his mother ruled as regent. Um, and the way he came to power has caused problems um, because it's led to a great deal of corruption. There's less, the people have less voice uh, because um, the powerful brought this king to power and so he owes them his throne. And so uh, people don't get heard as much and there's lots of corruption in the court. Um, so this reflects both on King, uh, King Swati III, as well as his mother, because they both rule, I should say maybe again, uh, Nefumbi, because they both rule jointly, so you can't just blame the, the, the king, because he was very young at the time he came to power, you have to, they jo rule jointly, so responsibilities probably are, uh, rest on both their shoulders for what has happened to the country um, since they came to power. Um, there's been uh, charges of political prisoners, arrests, um, people arrested for trying to speak out freely against the monarchy. Um, there's been alleged possibly deaths as well, but I haven't heard any names specifically tied to deaths. Um, uh, Nobel laureate Desmond Tutu wrote a letter, or signed a letter, speaking out against the human rights violations within the country, um, about just the rampant abuse of resources and, um, the way they treat the people of Swa Swaziland, uh, and just Lots of evictions from land, lots of struggle for the citizens of the country um, who aren't a member of the royal family. And then we get to Swati the Third's wives. <laughs> um, okay, so this this is, is going to be a difficult topic. So he has, the last count I read, he had 15 wives, I believe, um, at least 14. There might, have, there might be more now, because um, he seems to add them, he seems to add to their number quite frequently. Um, so issues with the way he chooses his wives, because go back up here. So there is a recent tradition, um, I say recent, but um, in the 1840s, uh, Swahiland adopted a, a dance from a neighboring country called the Reed Dance. It happens annually. Um, and it's become a, a cultural tradition today. So annually, they do it every year. Um, and the dancers are young maidens from across Swahili land. And um, not every year, but many years, uh, the king, Swati III, has chosen a new wife from among the dancers who have jo joined his other wives in marriage to him. Like he doesn't divorce, he marries them all, he marries them all at the same time. Um, and they say the girls um, attend voluntarily, but there's also talk of, you know, the parent, if the daughters are absent, the parents are uh, dealt out heavy fines. Um, 
and possibly other repercussions if they choose not to dance. Um, and I heard, uh, I saw one play said that they use this as a form of propaganda because when the girls return to their villages, uh, they sing songs um, approved by the government about, you know, not wanting political parties, probably supporting the the monarchy. <laughs> um, so lots of thought is going on with these reed dances, and it's also where the king sometimes chooses a new wife. Um, so one of the difficulties of that is that, um, let's see, I'm going to quote this directly, <laughs> um, from one of my sources listed below says, yet when asked by another reporter during our meeting whether women and girls are allowed to refuse the king's request for marriage, the palace governor lets out an extended cultural laugh. I'm sorry, he says, I'm not going to answer that one. So there's some question about e whether the girls can even turn down the king's request request for marriage. Um, and um, some of the, another um, girl from Swahili uh, points out that um, in this article that you probably won't see your family again if you marry the king. Probably, because some of them do see their families. But it's a possibility that you might not see your family again, uh, in in her viewpoint. Um, and there's been allegations about his behavior toward his some of his wives. Um, so I'll list some of them. Let's see. Uh, let's start with. Okay, I'm probably going to pronounce this name wrong. Uh, Angela Dalimi? Dalamini um, left South Africa, or left for South Africa in 2012. Um, she was one of his wives. Uh, she fled the country for South Africa, um, accusing him of emotional and physical abuse. Um, she said she'd been... Uh, unhappy for years, um, and one source said she uh, pretended to visit her parents' home, but she just disappeared and fled the country. Um, so that was one, and I guess she's one of it. She's the the third of uh, his wives to actually flee either his palace or the country entirely. Um, let me find another case. A lot of them in my notes. Um, uh, so the first um, to leave was, um, I didn't find much about her. It lists her name as Delisa Megwaza at age 30. She fled to London via Cape Town. It, the, the article didn't say why. Um, and then there was a second, a second woman fled, um, Putsonia Hawala, age 30, who had to flee and left behind her children, and then um, Angela fled. So there's those three cases of his wives who fled, and then, um, then there's uh, a woman named um, Nothando Dube, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, she was chosen to marry the king at age 16. Uh, she reported, it's very confusing what happened with this one. Um, she reported being abused by palace guards and kept under house arrest. Um, allegedly, she was kicked out of the royal palace at one point following an altercation with a security guard whatever that meant, um, and there were allegations against her as well that she cheated on the king uh, with a member of his government, some was his claim that was um, his best friend, and after the event she claimed that her husband, the king, held her prisoner for more than a year um, after she was caught with um, his close friend who was also the justice minister of Swaziland. 
Um, I'm kind of confusing with this one, but if you got to remember, she married the king at age 16. Um, and we don't know if she was able to refuse his request, if she wanted to. Um, so there's that to take into consideration as well. And uh, this same woman, uh, Nothando Dube, has actually passed away um, sometime around March 12th, 2019. Uh, she died from skin cancer, uh, officially. Um, she ha was 31, had three children. She married him um, in... Or she met him in 2004 when she was 16, and then she passed away from skin cancer. Um, at least, you know, she died in she died in Swaziland, so that's what the official sources say. <laughs> um, just just seem a lot of events happen around this wife in particular. So skin cancer seems kind of an interesting. Um, end to her life, considering all the allegations made by her and towards her. And that's all I'm going to say on the subject. <laughs> um, at least of this wife. Um, and then there was another wife, uh, Sente Masango. Um, they say he, she was his eighth, eighth wife. Um, she uh, was found um, uh, deceased, uh, and allegedly the official cause of death was, um, suicide. Um, she talks about, um, uh, she leaves behind two daughters, um, and so, says a week before her death, her sister had been buried, but, um, the allegations are that uh, she was not allowed to attend the memorial service for her sister. Uh, she lived alone in a mansion without visits from her husband. Um, and she took her, allegedly took her own life. Um, she, she was 18 when she married him. And that was September 1998. So she was 18... How old would he? Like she, she was eighteen in nineteen ninety nine, and the king was born in nineteen sixty eight. So there's a bit of an age gap between them. Um, sorry, this is just really sad. Uh. And the last one I want to talk about is um, um, another wife of his, uh, Zena Malengu. Um, so I haven't even found very much about her particular case, um, but it seems like it's the most controversial of all of his wives that I was able to find. Um, so in 2002, her mother, the mother of his wife, uh, filed a lawsuit alleging that the king's um, servants, aides, whatever you want to call them, had kidnapped her daughter, who became the king's wife, from school and forced her to join the and forced her to marry the king and join the royal harem. Uh, so. Um, and so I dug a little deeper into that one because that one really caught my eye. Um, and yeah, the, so Zena Malengu's mother, um, Zengu Malina is referred to as a schoolgirl in this other article. Um, her mother filed suit against the king in a court case. Um, it said... Um, uh, that her daughter had been kidnapped, um, mentioned what a nightmare this was for the mother, um, said her daughter was 18 years old, 
This was in 2002 again. King would have been in his mid-30s. Her daughter was 18 years old. She was seen in public in the company of four of the king's other nine wives uh, for the first time, but she had disappeared in September. Disappeared. <laughs> it's an interesting choice of word. Um, uh, so this article was published uh, uh, 2002. Um, let me see. 2002. Let me try to get the date of 2002 article. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. Uh, so this was published in November. Um, and the article came out in September, so that, I guess that tells me nothing. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm trying to gather when she would have disappeared because the article didn't specify. Oh, oh, sorry, she disappeared in September, and then this article came out in November of that year, so it was a whole month. And then, so she disappears in September, and sometime in November, the girl is seen in the company of four of the king's nine other wives since her disappearance, the first time since her disappearance. So it, it legit, like, from the way this article is framed, it legit does sound like a kidnapping case. Um, but um, this, she was, the girl was 18 at the time, and even though the mother went to court to try to claim her daughter was abducted um, and to get her release. Um, I didn't find anything that implies that the girl was um, let go, and I think she actually did end up marrying the king. So that's really, that's really sad. Um, and I don't know how she disappeared or where she disappeared from, but she might have disappeared from the mother one said she was kidnapped from her school. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. Uh, all right. So that's what I was able to find about his wives, or some of his wives anyway. Um, and like I said, uh, his mother, the, the queen regent, or the queen mother, um, continues to hold her post and she must have some degree of power within this government but I can't say how much exactly or what her responsibilities are um, but she reigns jointly with her son and there's a lot of corruption and issues within the, co the country they rule together and sadly that's all I could find about her <laughs> so I'm really sorry I wanted to find more about um this particular queen mother in specifically, uh, but she might be one more of the more people who like wield power from the background. Even though we know she has some power, we don't know how she uses it, what she does with it, and such. She stays in the background wielding power. From what I was able to gather from my uh, research. But she's a queen who... Um, she rules the country in the modern world. Um, and the uh, story of his wives was really sad. <laughs> uh, so, that was, say this is about Queen Nitfumbi and her son's wives. Queen Nitfumbi and her daughters-in-law, various daughters-in-law. All right, so I'm going to wrap this one up. Oh, this one was so sad. Um, I'm going to be looking at more um, rulers that more historically based, so there'd be less problems with analysis of their reigns. Um, or maybe not less problems, but different kinds of problems with analysis of their reigns, depending on how far back in time they ruled from. So I hope you enjoyed this video, um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, my Patreon link will be down below if you want to join and get early access to some more of these videos, because this is awesome! I'm having so much fun! And I will catch you next time. Thanks for supporting me on YouTube and on Patreon. Bye!